Alistair, right? Yes. Okay. Merhabalar herkese. Ee, sanırım yavaş yavaş başlayabiliyoruz. Ee, hoş geldiniz. Ee, bugün e, üç tane konuğumuzla e, tiyatro eğitiminde e, hassas bir mesele olan dokunma üzerinden bir sohbet yapmayı e, istiyoruz ve çok mutluyuz. E, Konuklarımız kısa sürede bize e, davetimizi, e, davetimizi kabul ettiler, geldiler sağ olsunlar. Ben size şimdi kısaca e, onları tanıtmak istiyorum. E, öncelikle e, Sinead O'Keefe'yi tanıtayım. E, Sinead e, Londra'da e, Central e, School, e, pardon şuradan birazcık karışık bir şeyimiz var. Evet, Central School of Speech and Drama'dan mezun. Aynı zamanda tiyatro çalışmaları, Ulster Üniversitesi tiyatro çalışmalarından da lisans derecesini almış. Çok deneyimli bir hoca. İngiltere'de birçok okulda hocalık yapmış. Özellikle Lambda ve Rada yine Royal Central School of Speech'i verebiliriz. Şu anda da Floransa'da şehir tiyatrosunun okulu olan Oltrarno'da e, hareket yönetimi e, üzerinde ders veriyor. Yani hareket e, derslerinin yönetimini yapıyor. E, welcome Sinead. <gülüyor> e, evet, Danio Papadelli ise e, hareket üzerinde çalışan, Londra'da şu anda e, çalışan e, Yunanlı bir sanatçı. E, özellikle attunement, uyumlanma üzerine çalışıyor ve bu çalışmalarını önceki Doğu Bloğu Avrupa Tiyatrosu geleneklerinden, dans ve tiyatrodan, kontak doğaçlamadan, somatik hareket, yoga ve dans çalışmalarından birleştirerek yapıyor. Şu anda Goldsmiths ve Rose Bruford College'da hareket e, dersleri veriyor ve aynı zamanda beden ağırlıklı devising e, çalışmaları tiyatro çalışmaları e, yapıyor o, o dersleri veriyor aynı zamanda Middlesex Üniversitesi'nde Lambda'da ve Drama Studio'da da atölyeler yapıyor Welcome Vanyo <gülüyor> e, Üçüncü konuşmamızı konuşmacımızı aslında çoğunuz tanıyorsunuz Özlem Özsadeş ee, o da İstanbul Üniversitesi e, tiyatro eleştirmenliği ve dramaturji mezunu ama aynı zamanda stüdyo oyuncularında da e, oyunculuk çalışmalarını tamamlayıp stüdyo oyuncularının birçok oyununda e, sahneye çıkmış bir oyuncu. Sonra da Middlesex Üniversitesi'nde masterını tiyatro yönetmenliği alanında e, tamamladı e, ve Kadiras Üniversitesi tiyatro bölümünde uzun süredir Birinci sınıflarla, üçüncü sınıflarla hem doğaçlama hem karakter e, e, çalışmaları e, üzerine e, gidiyor. Aynı zamanda da üçüncü sınıf oyunlarını yönetiyor. E, bu üç konuşmacımızda e, biz özellikle e, istedik ki hakikaten tiyatro eğitiminde, dans eğitimindeki dokunma e, meselesi üzerine e, konuşalım. Çünkü hakikaten e, hem gençler hem de çok deneyimliler. Ee, ve işin hem eğitim tarafındalar hem de e, sanatçı olarak yaratım tarafındalar. Dolayısıyla e, farklı kültürlerden geliyorlar. Aynı zamanda da kendileri de farklı kültürlerde çalışıyorlar. Ee, özellikle Vanyo ve Sinead için bunu söyleyebiliriz. Özlem de e, Oltrano'da dersler veriyor. O da İtalya'da hocalık yapıyor. O da öyle bir hocamız. Dolayısıyla onların aslında bu farklı kültürlerde e, çalışmalarında e, kazandıkları deneyim üzerinden de biraz konuşacağız. E, şimdi e, hemen e, aslında e, konuşmacılarımıza söz vermek istiyorum. Ee, ara ara belki birazcık Türkçe e, şeyler yapabiliriz, e, tercümeler yapabiliriz ama ağırlıklı olarak İngilizce olacak e, bu sohbetimiz. 
Welcome again. Uh, we are very glad to host your um, discussion today. Uh, as we talked, it's a very loaded subject, uh, touch, instructional touch in the theater training and dance training. So I would like to open up the, the uh, discussion uh, focusing on uh, contextualizing uh, uh, the issue of touch. How, do we, how can we contextualize the issue of touch? It is such a loaded issue. Uh, and I think it's important to be able to talk about various frames and as she uh, mentioned, scaffolding, uh, especially of touch uh, as an issue. So uh, please uh, feel free to start. Uh, I hope we can, we, we, we will be able to discuss about the solutions to the problems rather than shutting down various opinions in this discussion. So the floor is yours. Whoever wants to speak, start. Um, I, I, I, I can go first, okay. Um, I can just talk about the contextualization because I mentioned it yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a chat we had together. So I will mainly talk about my experience of working as a movement tutor uh, for um, uh, a course called European Theatre Arts uh, at Rose Buford College, uh, which is for uh, students who um, uh, study how to devise and perform in their own work. Uh, and some of them go on to kind of more traditional acting, uh, but also they're all, they, they, they are taught how to kind of make, uh, have ownership of their own work and how to maybe become trainers themselves and run workshops. Um, um, so I will draw my, some of my examples mainly from there. So uh, I teach uh, movement uh, to first and second years and I'm their main uh, movement tutor there. And um, I, uh, when I say contextualized touch, I usually introduce it in the second um, term of the first year. So in the first year, I try to um, establish the foundations for uh, anatomical awareness and uh, training curiosity about the moving body uh, through practice such as somatic movement, um, lab and bartene fundamentals, uh, which talk about different connectivities between uh, breath and movement. Uh, the core of the body and the extremities of the body, uh, head and tail connectivity, uh, which kind of establish a sense of accessing the body and centering the body and grounding the body and becoming curious about how the body works, not only in the um, uh, in a uh, training context, but also in everyday life. So somehow to tease the student's curiosity about their moving body as a tool, as an apparatus, but also as a sensing and experiencing um, uh, entity and then uh, I introduce other kind of elements but uh, just to talk to return to the contextualizing um, element then in the second term uh, of the first years I introduced touch and um, we work mainly inspired by a form called contact improvisation which is a partnering form uh, that in, involves a weight sharing and um, sharing of the physical space of the bodies and um, I try to contextualize why we're working with touch and for you know and uh, it's not just touch that gives an impulse it's full body touch very often um, most often in contact improvisation and so I, I explained that for me this is um, really fundamental um, for um, uh, understanding uh, how um, uh, how uh, every student can negotiate their own weight and you can really sense weight, your own weight and how you navigate your weight in the space uh, often much better by uh, um, uh, giving some of your weight and surrendering some of your weight to another body and to multiple bodies also in, in the room. So I try to establish that this is really important for them to gain an understanding uh, of um, how they navigate their own weight and also how they, um, uh, they can also um, understand and sense habitual ways of managing muscle tone 
And this for me is really key for, um, uh, uh, for performing and for acting. Muscle tone affects the emotional, to emotional tone and affects the way you are on stage. And with contact improvisation and partnering techniques that we're exploring together, you can really uh, have a sense of your own tone once you come in contact with another body you understand that you may be rigid or you may be too limp or you may be too heavy or you may be holding your weight and your center away from another body so i talk in kind of technical and anatomical terms and explain that we're doing this to gain these physical tools um, and many others but also as a way of us, uh, of building trust among us. And this is reciprocal. So we need to build trust in order to work this way, but also working this way in, um, augments, increases the levels of trust between us because we manage to achieve something together. When you see two students managing an acrobatic kind of lift or something, um, something that has to do with sharing weight or letting go of weight, you see the thrill in the faces and you see that, oh, you know, I managed, you know, and you see like they're the really um, uh, glowing from, from joy. And this is not always the case, of course. So I don't want to kind of brush over and say that for everyone is that amazing experience. And we can, we can go on to examples later, but uh, I contextualize why you're using touch. And then I explain that this is, um, uh, the way we will do it is uh, first by working on the physics. And um, I acknowledge that when you are in contact with another body, that can bring sensuality and sometimes sexual, sexual kind of uh, feelings. But that's not what we're working with. So if that arises, then it's something that you need to move away from or move with it in order to transform your energy. Not because, you know, we don't acknowledge that sexuality exists, you know, uh, but because that takes away the focus from the work and that can create, a, uh, that can affect the whole group and that can take, um, that can also create imbalance um, and um, uh, trespass boundaries. Uh, but I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, I'm, I, I'm not negating that touch can bring sensuality and can relate with sens sensuality. But I'm saying that what we're working with right now is a physical vocabulary. And that's what I'm going to be. Um, that's what I'm going to be using. That, that language I'm going to be using. Now, the other way of contextualizing is also showing them some videos. Sometimes I do it depending on, on the group and on their interest in dance theater and um, contact improvisation. Um, so sometimes I show them just very brief also uh, extracts of uh, companies who use physical contact, um, such as DVA to Frantic Assembly or uh, Pantstrang or whatever, like other companies that may use kind of um, this vocabulary and partnering techniques to tease and to tease their appetite and to, for them to understand why we're working with that. Um, okay, I'm going to shut up here. Um, there's other, other, other things that I do along the way, but uh, that's the main things. Yeah, just to, to introduce it. Yeah. Thank you, Vanya. That's a great start. Maybe we can continue with Sinead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vanya, because that was so uh, a comprehensive, a kind of... Um, description I feel like I really kind of understand where you are you know your, your approach already um, I think to, to add to that um, I would like to just talk about a little bit about contextualizing in terms of uh, for actors for acting the, re the, the reason that we we in, we have touch um, and as, uh, as movement people, it seems to fall quite easily into the movement kind of world. Um, and, and that is just that the, the, the, the character stories uh, can be told through different types of touch. Uh, the psychological interior of a character can be expressed through the, char the, the, the, the character's interaction and touch of objects and other people and their environment. And so it is a very key um, part of, of, the, of learning 
you know, the, the tools of acting that, that we learn how to understand the power of touch and how it can communicate to, uh, to, to the audience, the character. Um, and I think one of the things that I try to do is to separate in a way when, when I start uh, the journey in the first year um, is to work with touch, but without the psychology. So, so that the students can understand that you can add quality of movement to touch. And that is what tells the story, but that the touch that they give does not have to contain in it any emotions or any thoughts or feelings. It can be very neutral and that they can manipulate how they move and how the interaction happens. And that's what tells the story so that they have the control of that. Um, and that creates, I hope, a safe uh, space in order to mold and shape character to tell story. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, I think you, we can move on to Aslan. Um, such great intro uh, intro uh, intros from both of you. Um, I would like to contextualize in terms of, um, for example, in the first year, uh, when a student comes into the class, um, I want uh, how how how do I introduce them my touch? That's another issue because they do touch each other. Yes. And you, uh, you both explained it very well in terms of in practical and in uh, technical uh, terms. But at the same time, I'm a link. I'm a training to be a link later teacher. And in the first year, I do hands-on work with students, and I need to contextual. I, I need to explain them in which context and why I need to touch them, and am I, uh, and uh, in which case which is always, uh, they are allowed to say no. Um, and because, um, so what happens is we come to the class and we talk about our bodies and uh, touch doesn't necessarily, necessarily need to be um, actual touch with hands or body to body, but uh, with words, we do touch each other as well, because in Nick later work, it, it, there is a lot of metaphorical touch, like we give, met we try to drop metaphors in, in the diaphragm area, in the breathing area, or in the sacral area, uh, in the center, and feet everywhere, like, and we, we try to touch with words, uh, to their bodies as well, and that can end up being a really sensual, uh, relationship from my body, from my solar plexus to their solar plexus. So it's not just actual touch, but I end up needing uh, to contextualize my metaphorical touch to them uh, because it can be really sensual and emotional and psychologically uh, heavy experience for them as well. Uh, so what, how I bring up this subject and uh, put them in a context. Put, put a, in a context for them is, uh, I always say I might, I may need to touch you uh, because I may need to stimulate an area of your body that you are not aware of yet. And they come from high school, so the back, the back of the neck, sacrum. Like there are many places that is. Uh, not open to like that, that's not ready to work or they they are not connected with um, so to me there is a really huge need to explain that uh, okay I may bring out some like the, the work that we do may bring out some images that might feel like touch as well so uh, everyone can step out whenever they want if don't you don't feel uh, ready to step out because teacher has a huge power in the room uh, so we need to explain that as well uh, I you may you might feel that I'm 
a big power. So you, you, we need to communicate this. So con contextualizing how um, I need to explain very well. I might, I might touch your jaw at some point. I might touch your uh, neck at some point. I might do this. And maybe in a classroom, I would say, okay, everyone close your eyes. Who doesn't want to be touched? Raise your hand. <laughs> I see, like I map the room. Okay, then I will not. So no one knows what, the, what is the deal with me and that person specifically, because we never know what happens because uh, so it's it's to me it's really important to touch because we do I, I do need to stimulate those areas and they do need me to tell like help them or orient them in a way uh, but it's really important to put it in a context and for them to know why when how that will happen uh, so that they feel safe um, and also, uh, as you said, uh, I, because a teacher's touch is really impactful, powerful, uh, and that can be really essential for like mutually. Um, so I do need to say, okay, if you feel that it's like, that there's some really strong connection, that's not what we do. Then we can step out of the work because I'm your tutor, you are the student, and you do, because, this, because of the skin barrier, we do need that barrier between us so that you can work alone. You don't need me all the time. So um, this is how I kind of contextualize and explain what, how and why and in which context I would need to touch them and how they can stop me. Um, yes, I think that's more or less. Uh, great. Uh, actually, uh, with this, um, you know, um, um, explanation, maybe we can move on to this uh, aspect that different contexts call for different different approaches. Uh, and I would really like to hear uh, Sinead and Vanyo's opinion in that, because working with students, as you all described, uh, coming from the high school or the first year students, is very different than working with participants in a workshop, you know, outside of educational institutions. So how do you kind of move among these different uh, profiles? Perhaps Özlem gave an introduction to us. Uh, maybe you can continue, Sinead and Vanyo, on this aspect. Sure, shall I? I'll, I'll go. Um, yes, so the, the main differences uh, tend to be tend to come from experience from life experience I would say more than anything else actually because sometimes when I'm working in professional settings with professional actors they can have more resistance um, than students um, so uh, I, I generally don't think that there is, um, or I haven't yet found that there is a, a, a kind of system or process that it really it is a, a relationship that develops between you and the group. Uh, I don't work with very young children. I haven't got a lot of experience of that or with teenagers either, either just from kind of university level up so I'm sure that there are many things that you know my, I can I cannot talk to to that because I don't have that the experience of that but um, with the students we we have uh, I uh, we ask for health histories and um, movement histories and I find that this is a really good way of uh, getting a lot of information from a student um, that they might feel a little bit too um, self-conscious to offer in the room. And that's where things like re resistances to being touched for various reasons might actually come up. And then you can start a dialogue from the information that they offer. So that's often how, how I start with the students, um, which is useful. 
when working with professionals, actors, you don't often have, <laughs> have that opportunity. Apart from time being very condensed and um, you know, you're in there for an hour to create a product of some kind and then you have to get out again. It's a very different, it's a very different way of working. And that is when I'm totally led by the actor often. You know, that that what I first do is I sit there and engage with the act with the actor, ask them what they're thinking, what their ideas are, so that we start an exchange that then the topic of touch, for instance, will then come come up. Uh, but through character, kind of so that that's the framework that that I'm working with. And then for that it empowers them to be able to say, you know, what they personally are happy to do um and what uh, what the character what is required of the character yeah so it's a it's a movable feast really i would say i haven't yet found a system yes thank you vanyo I really love the metaphor of the movable feast. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I totally agree with you that um, uh, there is no system, but there is a sense perhaps of um, approach uh, on your, you know, on your side as a tutor. Um, and there are some key principles for me that are important for them to kind of relax into the room. Um, and for me also to find a way of tuning with each group. Um, and uh, number one is empathy and listening for me. And that, that took me quite a few years. So for instance, when in the first years of teaching, when I would uh, see a resistance from students, I thought that was because I did something wrong and I was taking it personally. Perhaps I was thinking, oh gosh, what did I do wrong? And then I've kind of switched a little bit my approach and I'm thinking, okay, what could be happening with a student? What, what is it that they may be coming from? And why could they, um, why may, may, why do they respond this way? What is it in our communication? What may have happened before? What is it in their, uh, the, the general uh, climate of their school? Um, in what stage are they of their term? So I'm trying to kind of, you know, gauge and see where they, they may be and where I may meet more resistance. And this is more, uh, this is easier when I work for a long time in some places and then I know the environment and I understand the uh, progression of the students and what they are dealing with. So that's, that's number one, like a sense of understanding where they may be, why they may be emotional, why they may be touchy, why they may be uh, resisting. And I, what I try to do is like to reiterate whenever I work with contact that um, uh, this is your space to learn and discover. And if something feels uncomfortable, you can always say no to what is happening. So I, I keep reminding them. And this saying no is a big issue. You know, how do you say no? Um, I, I, I, I can give some examples later that are kind of almost technical. Um, the other thing that I do uh, is uh, when I work with contacts um, uh, with them and I let them also improvise with contacts, I try to intersperse uh, activities that involve contact with others that do not involve contact. So especially if we've worked a lot with physical contact, I make sure that then I have a moment where I give them space and I, I make a lot of jokes also about, you know, how it can feel sticky or come on, get, get away from each other and just breathe and let's see how the space now is activated. And I, uh, and, and then I explained that why were we in contact for so long is maybe to feel that kind of um, density of the space and then feel what resonates after that and how the, what we call, you know, the third space, the in-between space, how it feels that vibrating. So I, I, I can explain why we work with contact. Um, uh, uh, so that's another, another thing. As Oslem, you were speaking, you, you said about your own touch. So in the first term, I work with um, yoga as a warm up, uh, yoga based uh, sequences and a lot of breath uh, infused work. 
and I asked them to place their hands on their own body a lot. And um, we, call that kin we call this kinesthetic feedback. So we create the shared vocabulary. And uh, I, I, I, then the, it becomes their vocabulary. They say, oh, I gained kinesthetic feedback. <laughs> kind of, you know, touching my ribs and feeling my diaphragm kind of expanding and closing. And then when I am to give contact, uh, when I am to give touch with them, I think, you know, I, I explain, but also I give uh, times for... Um, group feedback and for partner feed feedback to say how they felt and what did the hands do um, uh, to their body? How did they enable them uh, to let go of existential? We usually uh, talk a lot about that, like, you know, how touch can enable letting go of excessive excess tension in the body and habitual tension in the body. So again, there's a vocabulary that they understand because it's all about tension for them and how can I be more relaxed on stage and kind of more at ease with my body. So that's the vocabulary that we're using, the kinesthetic feedback, the letting go of excess tension. And then this is a little bit of the scaffolding that Sinead made me think. Um, I do two things that's very that's quite recent which are quite recent especially with the pandemic also they were very popular <laughs> it's like this thing of self-touch self-contact so when you move how would you like to be touched so imagine that there is a hand that gives you kind of impulses i know this sounds like oh gosh what <laughs> how much can we imagine again of like having a partner but actually i did that in a, um, a community class like the london contact memorization class where i said to participants from different kind of uh, backgrounds and, and and and abilities it's like how would you like to be touched so can you give that touch to yourself and then when you go to a partner can you be can you emulate this kind of touch and, and this kind of listening? So that kind of eases a little bit this sense of like, oh, I'm going to be touched by someone else because already you're prepared. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I try to do uh, before we introduce touch that has a specific intention, I borrow this from Kirsty Simpson, who is um, uh, a really incredible teacher in, in contact improvisation world uh, who uses this term hands that do not want anything so when we first improvise with each other I say okay can you let go as Sinead said said of any intention action emotion and and, and the impulse to do something to the other person can you refrain from doing something and just place your hands let them sense and let your partner respond. So we work a lot initially with a sense of sensing and experiential touch uh, where the, the hands sense the shifts on, in weight and the shifts in orientation and they give minimal impulses or minimal intentions. So it's not like this thing of like, okay, I'm going to do this to you and I want this specific result from, from the exercise. Uh, but first is the step of hands that do not want anything and they are there to give feedback. So we enter this world of senses and perception. So, and we explain that, that what we're doing is like we are um, uh, activating other senses other than vision, which is kinest kinesthesia and touch. And these are really important for you as performers, actors, dancers, uh, for a variety, you know, for a multiplicity of reasons. So it's this kind of like stepping back, um, listening, this kind of sense of kinesthetic listening to establish first a relationship, respect, boundaries, and to also listen to each other's intentions. Where am I active? Where am I passive? Where am I doing too much? Um, I don't know if that makes sense. So that's kind of some strategies of... Um, getting them on board because then they see that, oh, okay, oh, I can relax into that. Um, and, and then I, I see the difference also in my movement because I relax into someone else's hands, I give my weight, and then, oh, I can see the difference in how I then manage my own weight and how I am in the space with others. Great. Um, this makes me think about the pedagogical approaches. Of course, you all talked about just now, but maybe we can move on a bit further uh, in terms of pedagogical approaches. Uh, I just would like to underline um, certain aspects of the pedagogical uh, you know, approach. 
uh, we can talk about trainers trainings you know the methods of how trainers trained in this um, um, field uh, so the role of intuition, you also mentioned yesterday when we were chatting, the role of intuition uh, uh, for trainers. Uh, also political views, you know, political stance of the trainers uh, and, uh, and the educators experience and qualifications. So I think you can move on from this um, uh, discussion uh, towards the pedagogical aspects. You already mentioned some of them, but maybe you can uh, a little bit, you know, um, uh, dwell into them. Uh, maybe I could start with that, if that's okay. Um, I think it's really, to me, uh, the crucial thing is uh, in theater training, especially or movement, something, anything that involves the body, uh, is that the train the tutor uh, is trained with, on their own bodies? So um, to me, it's really they have to be sensible enough. At least uh, we have to be sensible enough to uh, try, experience, get feedback, get criticized. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not. Maybe uh, fail, get up, <laughs> fall down. And then like experience everything in our bodies, the touch, be touched, and then um, uh, share that experience with other people, maybe with uh, students or may maybe with other colleagues. So to me, that's the main thing because um, in theater training, especially students have huge regressions. Um, when, they, when they come in, they are 18 years old or 25 or 40 even in, in our school. Uh, but whenever we start with the, uh, releasing the excess tension and uh, finding back your own spine and getting connected with your uh, energy areas, etc., and your feet, uh, your connection with the ground and the anti-gravity, uh, that's like ba baby steps, like for first three months and then the first year and then uh, learning how to, how, to uh, how to separate from your mother, finding back your spine. So uh, you, you end up like your skin ego and your, your body is re being recreated, being undone and being recreated. Uh, so it's scary. It's scary. You might fall down on your face. You might be punished you you have like you have all these nightmares coming back to you uh, and you might feel the support of your mother at your back uh, holding you from your back you might not want your mother to touch you because maybe it was too much uh, but you need to experience and see how that is not just physical but it is the skin that carries the entire psyche and the uh, rest like uh, the history of your uh, of you as a person as an ego uh, right now that is ready to change that is ready to become another form of adult and will be shifting uh, like day by day uh, so i think that's very to me that's very important that the tutor is uh, experiencing these scary moments of training um, then you have the license so that doesn't mean that uh, everyone needs to get this certificate and that certificate and 560 euros for this workshop i'm not suggesting that but at the same time uh, you need if you are being uh, going to be self-taught and taking the steps you have to be courageous enough to attend other people other pe people's classes um, because then you can share the experience as Vanya said when I started when I started the first teaching I was really quite like furious and like okay what's wrong with me and what's and then you see, like, it's, it's, it's the relationship. It's like, you just need to listen more. You, your body needs to listen more. But that's only, that comes with the experience of an actor as a movement person. I don't know. But uh, I think that's really, in, I would put that as a must. I say if there are any musts. 
um, and the political views and intuition <laughs> that's a tricky one maybe you keep going and then we come to the, <laughs> that subject a little bit later because then I get a bit too uh, emotional <laughs> Um, so there's quite a few things I will try to respond to um, what you said about the importance of the trainer to, um, to be trained and to carry on with their training. And if life doesn't allow that because of responsibilities, I guess, I mean, when I, uh, for me, when I became a mother, you know, it was a different story. Um, uh, but then it was a, again also a completely different knowledge that I gained and understanding of the other <laughs> um, but um, it also and also it made me suddenly you know I, I was this kind of able-bodied you know like I could move a lot and then suddenly I I couldn't so that gave me such a great I guess um, um, understanding of when students would say look I, I, I cannot do that or I cannot do this other thing because before that I was like oh maybe it's laziness maybe it's this or that or maybe it's a bad day and you can do it and then I realized okay sometimes the body yes it cannot do and you have to really respect um, the boundaries and when the, your body says no to some stuff so I think that taught me to give more uh, space for um resting and for kind of maybe a slower pace um also it made me uh, slowly and that that didn't happen immediately also explain that look i cannot do exactly that you can do it much better perhaps than me uh, right now uh, so that kind of made me maybe uh, increasingly more um precise verbally because i was so reliant on demonstrating physically so therefore you know um I'm now quite vocal. I'm sure like if you two demonstrate, you will do it uh, better. Or like, I'm sure like, you know, I, I show something and then, you know, that can, um, can you, you can do it in your own way also. So uh, to kind of be more adaptable um, and more understanding, I guess. Um, and for me, the retraining is important uh, to kind of keep myself active in different ways. So that's why I kind of, I went into yoga two years ago to uh, kind of refocus my mind into a new technique to learn something new um, and to gain a new vocabulary as well and and to refocus my mind because uh, you know when you teach something for a long time you enter sometimes an automatic kind of uh, way of teaching so it was a way of refreshing uh, my tease my own kind of interests um, and uh, the other thing that you said, what was it about the regression? Yeah, this is very important uh, also that um, they, uh, the students need to kind of be uh, kind to themselves when they are regressing or when they're realizing that, okay, I, I could do it two weeks ago. No, I cannot do it. Or um, I thought I could do it and I cannot do it. So that this kind of sense of... Um, the back and forth, uh, and the stumbles and the falls um, in, in, in the training that are very important. And um, for me, humor is important there, <laughs> you know, to have like the sense of humor, to make myself also, to parody myself often, you know, um, in a way, and um, to give a lot of space for feedback for like partner feedback and that is different to group feedback different things are said in partner feedback um and um yeah the other thing is about emotions you know sometimes uh students say oh that was too emotional and i'm like well that's part of you and it's about learning how to manage it when you go into out in the professional world you will have to manage that a lot so it's about um also embracing that some work can bring some emotions and we're here to contain them we're here to say okay this is what's happened if you need some more time you can take it if you want to have a one-to-one -one, let's have it um, but also don't think that you are on your own you did something wrong if you had an emotional release you know this is part of the process of learning um, yeah I think yeah it's a lot uh, there's a lot there 
and about the consent also the how to say no that's another story yeah we can talk about it maybe later for time but um, maybe Sinead or uh... um, yes I, I uh, agree and I'm at the moment I'm uh, learning a new piece of uh, or going deeper into a type of movement that I I've always wanted to and never had the time to, but now have the time, thanks to COVID. Um, one thing that was good about COVID. Um, and I have to actually, I, a technique that I'm using and I'm thinking I might use this with the students uh, is that I have to talk to myself. I actually have to be my own teacher. I have to say the things that I say to my students to myself because even with all the movement experience I've had even with everything that I know that there, there are times when you are learning something new when you fall back into those default positions of fear of closing down of judging and um and I was struck uh last week when I was doing a, a particularly tricky move of of, of a baby and how when they have developmental kind of uh, breakthroughs, you know, the sort of enthusiasm that a parent has, that there is something about that, not that you uh, treat a student like a, a baby, I'm not talking about that, but what I'm talking about is the wonder of the physical discovery that you as a, as a tutor can hold that for the student in those difficult times when they are really reaching those brick walls that, you know, if I keep my sights on that, um, that wonder of that physical achievement, of that ability to listen, to touch, to open up a new awareness, you know, to really receive someone else's impulse, um, they are, you know, we get so used to, or we get desensitized sometimes, I think, to the, that, ex, that experience of the new, the new. And as you said, to be, to be the teacher, but also the student is, uh, at the same time, is very important, I think. And uh, with touch, I think it's really important because in a way, um, we're having to frame something for the students, which is, like walking you know it's like why does any or breathing you know it's like everyone breathes why do i need to breathe why do i need to learn how to walk why do i need to learn my you know anything about my spine why do i i know how to touch i'm touching all the time <laughs> you know so we have to kind of undo a little bit um the the desensitized uh everyday life and uh, uh view lens of looking at the world and experiencing the world so that we are able to imbue um, and really celebrate progress of awareness, of sensitivity, of touch, of being able to receive and, and, and give, uh, to listen, not just with the ears, but yes, with the, with the body and the sensibility of the body. Um, so uh, in terms of pedagogy I think that that does start very much with self-touch you know that there is a lot of kind of discovery of the of yourself I love that Vanya what you were talking about like that you are the instigator of what you would like to receive you know you know COVID has given us these strange <laughs> opportunities um and, and I do a lot of, uh, you know, like the anatomical touch, like so discovering and massaging the foot and just, you know, touching the knee and really what is the knee and trying to, um, through touch, build up a, a picture of your own skeleton, you know, or that for the students. Um, and then to, to, to how sight is the first touch you know, that we, we know how something feels before we touch, touch it because we see it. And then they, and then touching, for instance, that that's like a little exercise that I do as a, as a stepping stone into touch to heighten the awareness. Um, 
and and then into partner touching. Uh, but but always the framework. Uh, this is one of the scaffolding things. <laughs> is uh, is that it's the touch is for the purpose of the exercise. That there is no other agenda other than what the exercise is, is going to offer and, and what you can discover within the exercise. And I think that's such an important kind of point that I do keep, you know, listening, you know, you must li listen, what is listening? You know, we talk a lot about that. Um, but then the student, you know, taking themselves, the ego, uh, their own agendas out of the work, that we work without that and particularly with touch you know because otherwise sometimes and i have i i, I you know i put myself in this category too uh, you know i the agenda to do something to someone else to make them feel something you know to have a, an end game and and that that just closes down opportunities and it closes down discovery and so i would say those are kind of two of the key things and then leading into uh touch with with partners that would be more experiential uh, but a cyclical thing it's not one thing after another it's not a linear thing it's happening in different at different times i would say yeah well that gives me uh the pleasure of um talking about a little bit about this creation of the safe environment to explore. You all touched, it's very interesting, you all touched poles like oversensitizing um, body and desensitized body through touch experience. So it's such an interesting uh, actually talk for me because we can both include this very different poles in the experience of touch. And that's why I think there are many levels of touch, touching and using touch in an instructional way uh, to be discussed. So um, Sinead, you touched into the, the, the subject of the pleasures of touch. Uh, I think we can continue from there um, because it's a, a very important sense uh, of, of humans and it's, it creates really direct communication uh, and it carries a lot of memory triggered also, um, both, you know, positive and negative memories. That's also a very tricky, uh, you know, uh, field, uh, but it's a subjective uh, also value. It has a subjective value of touch. Um, so feeling of being good, you know, and the reformative aspects of touch, deepening contacts, uh, the, the possibility of deepening contact. So while we are all talking about these, how do we really create a safe environment to explore? Maybe you can a little bit, um, you know, um, uh, you can talk a little bit about that too. I mean, you all touched this aspect, of course, but maybe you would emphasize certain points, uh, like you all talked about empowering the students, uh, the, the, the freedom of saying no, but how do you build that kind of awareness of the body, you know, uh, in order to be able to say no, because it's a very difficult thing to do most of the time. Uh, so maybe, you know, um, how do we create healthy boundaries? Maybe you want to add something to that. Um, yeah, great. Uh, I may say a few things. Maybe I will repeat a few things. But um, uh, So for me, in the scaffolding and the hierarchy of things, as Sinead also said, I usually introduce touch with a non-narrative context. And I explain in the beginning that let's experiment with contact from a physical perspective in order to train physical safety first. 
So once you understand how things work, like as if, you know, the mechanics of weight and momentum and gravity and um, pressure, then, uh, uh, and then you create some tools for, uh, and you create the foundations for taking more risks, physical risks. Um, what I would maybe do then, you know, apart from the hands that do not want anything or the uh, self-contact, is I, I would kind of introduce exercises, I will demonstrate, I would let students uh, try, try it with different bodies. And I say, if something feels wrong or too much for your body, you can always say no verbally. Uh, and it's not a big deal if you say, okay, that's not okay for my body. Uh, and uh, I also ask them first to also share any injuries and repeat and remind each other if there's any injuries or any conditions on each day. So I ask them, is there anything we need to know before we start training that will affect our training together? So <laughs> that they don't start saying, oh, you know, I've had breakfast and all of that. You know, they, they made it. anything that is relevant to what we do and that will affect our training. So uh, then another thing that I would do in the, um, when the exercise enters into more like improvisational context is I will re-repeat the instructions many times and maybe with different phrasing for students that may be neurodiverse or for students that may be absent-minded. I'm one of these. Sometimes I really need a repetition of instructions as a student. Um, and I try to repeat also, which creates a sense of safety. Then they realize where they are because sometimes the improvisation can take them into this kind of sensory, sensual kind of tangent. And then it could be like, <laughs> I'm feeling and sensing and touching and I don't know where I am. Uh, or I redirect their focus. If I see, so for instance, in cases where I sense sometimes, okay, there is someone who is trespassing the boundaries, I will redirect the focus of the whole class so that I don't single them out. Um, I will kind of slowly kind of uh, uh, place the focus in a, a different kind of um, uh, area. So I will redirect their attention. So that's kind of like a trick for me as a teacher. Or I will pause and ask for an immediate quick feedback um, and then continue. Or like a game, let's change partners. <laughs> Let's just like go and change. Uh, I'm sure you do. You do these things. Um, other times, I may wait and see where you know. I may go close to that kind of like maybe partnership and give them individual feedback silently, or uh, ask if you're all okay. Is it working? Do you need any more? So then I, they enter. They exit out of that kind of maybe other space that may feel a little bit kind of you know borderline. Um, in some cases, I may speak to students at the end if I feel there is anything and um, that needs to be addressed. Very rarely, though, um, it hasn't been necessary um, uh, many times. Uh, and um, what I want to say, um, yeah. Uh, I've had some students recently who now that a lot of kind of mental health or like other other conditions are more and more disclosed and we receive these kind of disclosures. I've had um, a couple of students who had sensory sensitivity and they said, uh, look, look, there are some days I don't know what's happening with me. It was since I was a child that uh, touch is impossible. It oversensitizes me. It, it, it makes me uncomfortable. This specific person for some reason, once uh, they said what they said, then it was easier for them to navigate it. There were a couple of days when they said, look, it's a bad day. I said, okay, take your time. If you feel you, it's okay to enter, make sure you are warmed enough to enter again. But I am here to support you and it's okay to say no. So like repeating, like it's okay to say no or it's okay to say maybe and let's see what, what happens. And the last thing that I would do once I introduce, once we kind of do maybe kind of more somatic work and more kind of anatomical work and technical work, I do introduce narrative and touch and uh, I either allow it and I say, okay, allow story. Like what is the dialogue? What is your relationship now? Like uh, beyond the exercise or I give them themes, instruct, you know, tasks and, you know, I, I so there are external, uh, um, external themes. 
what what they I think they really enjoy and I had enjoyed it myself when I first tried it is this um, score of like okay say yes to touch that you receive a total yes surrender like really yield to whatever your partner wants to do and then say no so then we are kind of like almost role playing of like what is it to say no and how can you say no uh, to touch from the partner and they really enjoy it, enjoy it because that gives a lot of dramatic also conflicts you know and then it gives them a lot of choreographic also uh, material when they say no or then I say say maybe <laughs> and then play between saying yes and no to touch and then the other thing that really I find really the most amusing is like um, you can say whatever you want to and even irrelevant. So sometimes I demonstrate that. So you touch me and I, I don't like respond how I would in a kind of an impulse, you know, re retrieving from the or pushing into the touch. I just do complete something irrelevant and odd. And then we can kind of, again, find creativity in that. How do you respond to a, a partner's touch and tactile impulse and um, and I only do that if it involves weight sharing once we are safe, you know, and, you know, and I, I reiterate, okay, don't drop your partner from your back, obviously, you know, when you're safe, you can just like let go and be silly and kind of, so we, in this way, it's, uh, we take off the burden of having to perform beautifully and gracefully, you know, then, you know, awkward touch. Are we going to awkward touch? What is like the awkward? And how can you work with something that feels, uh, that doesn't feel right, but how can you use it for a narrative purpose, so storytelling, towards storytelling? Um, yeah, so that's... Vanyo, uh, this is a, a work you do with mostly with dancers, right? No, or, no, with theater, oh. theater performers. Oh, great. Okay. Theater performers who are interested in physical theater. Okay. Many of them are interested in physical theater. I've done this work with actors uh, and I, I introduced text. I've done uh, and, and in, the, in the improvisational uh, moments. I said, can you bring the text that you have? And you're not necessarily in the scene that you, in your, with your scene partner, okay? And I explained that we do this in order to deconstruct and undo the known uh, ways of speaking your text, number one, because by doing that, they, they different kind of qualities in their text come. And if they have a choreography, you know, like choreography meaning any kind of movement uh, sequence that they may have, physical action, that also teases the intention and the kind of the way they've constructed their approach to the physical material. So that's another work that we do. So if there is character involved. Um, and, and I say this, you can use it in your rehearsals, uh, as a warm up, like uh, in, then with your scene partner. I mean, it depends. I don't wanna kind of like take over, but um, yeah, um, different applications. Thank you. Maybe Sinead and Özlem can also talk about a bit of, you know, this actor's training uh, in terms of um, creating safe space, in terms of character developing uh, parts. Özlem, do you want to? No, no, I think you should okay. talk about the character developing and then I go to something else. Sure. Um, so, yes, developing uh, touch for, for, um, for character, things like um, intimacy or, or violence, um, they're, it's, they're, they, are, they are places where you have to be, I find that I really have to be very clear about touch and the language that I use in those moments and touch not being used as a metaphor, actually, because you have to separate our understanding of uh, the metaphorical touch being something that is an emotional connection and the physical contact, because it's a, kind, it's a safeguarding issue that we, we're very clear about how, how we talk and what we are talking about. And then it doesn't muddy and confuse the issue. Um, so for instance, if I would were helping to um, work on, a, on an intimate scene, 
we would very much start with the text and analyze uh, what it is, what is the dramatic content or humorous content, you know, why is the touch there, what is the purpose of the touch, uh, to create a dialogue and so that everyone is on the same page. And one of the important things I think is to, is to assume um, nothing about whether or not people have got an ethical way of working. Like it's best to just go, I, I'm not going to assume that you do, I'm just going to come in and we're going to go through these processes, these steps, and we will create a shared ethical way of working um, together. So after discussing what is needed dramatically, then talking about character and how the character receives and gives touch, the psychology of the character at that moment in time, kind of breaking it down into actions and steps so that, so that each, each, each bit of contact is, is in, can be isolated. Um, and name and naming it so that you really do name it. I touch your shoulder. And I then take my arm, my arm strokes down your, your, uh, your arm slowly, my hand strokes down your arm slowly. So, so the language is neutral. We're not talking yet about intentions with the quality of the movement, but we know that the, what the dramatic intentions are. And then once, we, once they've got that, like a choreography, and it's a bit like a dance, and you can speed it up and you can do fun things to lighten the mood and <laughs> make it a bit more, you know, less sticky. Uh, then, then starting to talk about what are the qualities of movement that we can use. Um, and, you know, and, and that's where, that's where then we're still separating because it's like, well, okay, I'm going to brush my hand slowly down your arm with the intention of comforting you or with the intention of nurturing you or with the intention of ar arousing you. And so it's the last thing that we actually look at is the the intentions. And then it just separates. I mean, it makes it so much easier for the actor to manage. And it's not then a sensory overload. Um, because we've all been talking about how touch is so uh, can be so overwhelming at times. And I find that often, particularly with intimacy, um, more so than with violence, you know, people are shy, you know, they do want to talk around the subject and not act and to the topic itself, you know. And so no euphemisms of like being really, you know, a breast is a breast, it's not a boob, it's not a tit, it's not a, you know, it's not any other colloquial kind of form of, of slang. It's just anatomical. Um, yeah, so that's, and that's how I put in safeguards for things like intimate, for intimacy. And it's the same with students. I do exactly the same thing with the students, um, you know, but it's really about having a dialogue before you get to that point with each actor individually as well, <laughs> to make sure that that's then where they can say, actually, you know, I am, maybe I, I have been, I've been attacked, you know, I really don't like strong, heavy pressure on my body, or I don't want to be, take, you know, I don't want anyone looming on me from behind. And those are the times when you can really then sort of like shape that shape it so that the content is safe for everyone, including the director. Obviously the director is, is um, in this, in this part of the process as well. I think, oh, I would love is that the training creates a, a, a platform where actors will do this themselves. You know, that the, that the director will go, okay, how, how do you want to do it? You know, how, how do you want to do this love scene? And that the actor will drive it maybe with, with the director 
and then there won't be movement people involved necessarily. Not that that's a bad thing. There might be times where they're needed, but I would like it to be actor led eventually. Um, I'll just talk briefly about this because you both covered 90%, <laughs> yeah, like really specifically, it was great to listen to both of you. Uh, I, I want to go back to the class uh, situations. Uh, firstly, I would never make assumptions, uh, as you said, Sinead, uh, about students' genders, um, ch their choices, and if a person looks like a man, I, like they, they don't necessarily need to be called like man up or you know like find the man inside you kind of like strange comments about their genders um so i firstly to create a safe space i would never make assumptions about students pasts and i would definitely tell the students not to make assumptions about each other's and not to make jokes about those gender fluidity of the class, basically. Um, so that's probably the first thing, because in Turkey, the like jokes about, women, like not just uh, LGBTQ, but uh, about women, like the language is really strong and heavy and the culture is really oppressing, to be fair. So, and also I think it's really important when the, in the context of a tutor's touch, um, I think what Sinead said about the touch, like intimate scenes and stuff, or how to introduce touch, intentions. Uh, this tutor cannot have any intentions. I think that's the main thing. So the, the intention could be uh, that the intention, by intention I mean um, to have power over students or to show how impactful their work is. Uh, to impress the students with a sensual uh, one-time uh, experience um, and to the, with their success, basically. So I touched to this point and I did this to, uh, to this student and he or me, she changed so much and they hate this. It's not you who is doing this, it's the student who is doing this and who, it's the student who is saying yes to the to the touch to the experience basically um and i think it's really important not to had not to aim a moment of heightened sensual uh, experience for the student uh, because yes that there is a tension really uh, access to tension relief in those moments but that doesn't mean that the student can repeat it so i always i would always aim which, is, which was not my first choice when I first started to teach. Uh, but now I would always aim a long-term change uh, made by the student on their own, rather than a moment of highly, like huge revelation, you know? So I think this is how I, after especially the obvious Me Too movement, I looked back I, at my uh, teaching habits and uh, approaches. And I think these, are, these were the first thing that I came up with uh, because to empower the student, I think the first thing I would like to do is to tell them uh, that no tutor can change your life. You are the person who chooses to enter to that room uh, to fully experience what experience what you are going to experience. So uh, so that they don't feel alone when they are out in the professional world. Um, so I think these are and also the as a, to want to refer to the regressions and how how the babies have or the kids have a huge emotional tantrums when they have these like attacks like growing up attacks <laughs> like horrible like what was it like terrible two horrible three whatever that was it I don't even remember anymore anyways um how like as a parent how uh the same as how how you cannot credit take credit for the for your kids two-year-old tantrums and uh growing up to be a three-year-old you cannot take credit for your student to grow up. <laughs> so you can only contain and contain the emotions and like let them be. Uh, and you cannot over support 
as a parent and as a tutor, I think. You cannot like applause for a poo <laughs> in terms of like, because it's, it's, it's a natural thing. So I think it's uh, really important to step back and watch. And of course they are not babies. So you have to make sure that there are those boundaries are not like not baby boundaries are like uh, adult to adult boundaries. Um, yeah, I would just add these to what you both said, I think. Well, I think there's a lot to think about uh, and we already ex exceeded our time, but um, maybe uh, last two, three sentences you would like to add in terms of policy making, um, in terms of how can we change some hierarchical uh, way of thinking, especially in Turkey, we have this, you know, extreme pressure at the moment. Um, also, it's such a um, delicate issue in the training uh, right now. Uh, we really like to um, uh, just hear your opinions on maybe two sentences that how you think that we can prevent the risk of rising conservative approaches in this field as well. Because with all the risks you are describing and with all the you know, delicate touch uh, of the trainers um, you know, uh, um, uh, environment, how can we prevent the risk of conservative approaches also? Um, maybe you would like to add one or two sentences and then we will um, open up the field for questions. I just want to say one sentence and shut up. <laughs> I think the art scene and the people who are like supporting the free touch, free love and freedom in arts shouldn't be the ones who suffer the most for these abuses and harassment stories and uh, oppressing stories about touch. So I think policy making in that sense is really important. And being in Turkey, in Istanbul today, the uh, re retreating, I don't know if that's the right word, from the Istanbul Convention. Um, I think we are in a bad state. Uh, but I think we should, as, as theater people and uh, as theater people and as uh, arts people, we should point out the policies and how people could be freer when are when when they are brought up, uh, uh, so that they are not scared to be touched touched at the first place. Because uh, we we do all these this work to be able to touch each other, not to touch each other. So it's scary to know that people are afraid of touching each other or some man to touch them. So I think that's the main issue about the subject. And yeah. Well, it's a very specific culturally what's happening now in, in Turkey from, you know, what I'm reading and what uh, you've heard, uh, what you've said also um, today and yesterday. And, um, and again, we are in the UK, so there's another kind of uh, cultural context as well. We're talking uh, yesterday about the no touch policies in schools and that students come with that kind of background and that you're somehow... Uh, maybe going against um, um, something that, you know, they've been kind of um, educated with. Um, one thing is about contextualization. <laughs> as, you, as you mentioned, it's like, why do we use contacts, physical touch? Uh, and how do we do it? So I had students saying after they had an intimacy workshop saying uh, what we would like is to know in advance what kind of uh, um, what kind of contact we would have. And for me, that was OK. I said, you know, when we improvise, how can I know in advance and tell you in advance what is going to happen if we're talking about uh, training contexts? But I totally understand the need to be as clear as possible about the aims and purposes of the exercises. And this needs to be reiterated and repeat and clarified again and again for some students. Um, in terms of policy making, my example um, is uh, 
Well, in terms of saying no, uh, within the practice, you can give them some specific ex uh, ways of saying no physically. So for instance, in contact, uh, we've got these ways of like saying no uh, by making our bodies as uh, wet and soft noodles. You know, like when someone tries to kind of like uh, lift us or move us somewhere, you just make your body really soft and then it's impossible <laughs> to move. You just, you know, evade or you move your center away, which is like an indication, okay, I'm not with you. I I I I'm not going there. Just listen to where I'm going. So there are also some technical ways and then you can kind of implement them and teach them, I guess, give some examples, so technical. And the third thing that I may want to say comes, I was looking yesterday a lot at um, uh, policies and regulations uh, that are um, in place for um, what is called contact, contact improvisation jams, which is like open space of people coming and uh, dancing together. And they may be quite useful because they've got like some interesting vocabulary. For instance, I found really interesting what they were saying about you have the right and responsibility to say no. And saying no may be tricky and it's a training and it is a progress. Of it, it is a learning, a learning, pro, uh, learning uh, process. How to say no. Uh, so um, it's not to also make people feel guilty if they feel that you know they they want to be polite and they don't know how to say no. I find it very difficult to say no often. So it's about training also and trying and give them also examples of how you can say no and how you can also create this open. Uh, so with these kind of policies, there's kind of clear boundaries. So if sexuality comes into the, you know, into the, the, the, the room, um, then we need to have a way of like channeling it away. So it's not saying no, because it's bad, but it's not useful and beneficial for the context of the class. So having like a, a, a language that kind of can kind of encompass um, uh, potential deviations <laughs> uh, from the focus of the class. And last, about the touch, is just to kind of um, experientially students can like um, ex um, have a sense of the benefits, but also you can name, I think, uh, by naming the benefits of, of touch and that, you know, the, the fact that it kind of activates different senses, it uh, uh, widens your attention it makes you also more prone to make more informed choices in movement and as Sinead was saying not to be in this kind of unknown unself-reflective space of touching and being touched but learning how to have intentional and attentional touch so I touch with an intention or I place my attention to uh, uh, the pressure on the object and that has a meaning for the audience so um, so it's like making differentiating al allowing students to differentiate uh, for handling objects for handling other people and for handling their own weight basically in their own shape uh, body yeah um, I yes that's fascinating I, I, I think I don't have anything to I don't have a solution, but I do know that when uh, challenging policy, uh, language is key. And there is, I think there is, you know, that I think we need to start to try to standardize or create language uh, which will provide uh, a way, a kind of a wedge in in those policies that are starting to close down and say and if they're speaking from fear or if they're speaking from well touches for instance yes it's just we, we just opt out of touch then it's like opening up the dialogue of like well but what is touch why why do why are we doing this we need to keep that dialogue going we need to keep talking about what it is and the pros and the cons of it uh, within the institution, you know, and finding the allies across the courses, because that's a difficult thing as well, particularly if you're in university settings where you might be the only, uh, you know, um, physical course, even, you know, in, in a course that in, and everywhere else it's a cerebral sitting down in, at a lecture, you know, but maybe it's things al almost like opening up 
workshops to other courses, you know, so that actually what you're starting to do is try to come in through the back door. <laughs> yeah, it's like giving exposure to the things that are essential about theatre, about theatre tra or actor training and offering that so that you're broadening people's perspective on it so that then you can have a dialogue because you can't have a dialogue if people don't understand what it is that they're actually trying to shut down and generally that's what happens is it's not it's not people in the theatre who are making these policy decisions it's administrators and yeah so I would say it's about trying to approach those people offering experiences even um, to them <laughs> as a part, um, in part, a way of starting a dialogue. I don't know. Well, thank you all. Um, I think, I mean, many points you make triggered me uh, in many ways, but we have to stop somewhere and open the field for questions. I in the beginning i sort of hoped to make a short um, you know transition translations uh, but i think we don't have time for it uh, but in the end uh, after some time we will um, you know use um, translations um, subtitles and, and, and it will be uh, uh, you know in youtube uh, so um, hopefully people would also, you know, um, can access in Turkish too. So thank you all for uh, this very, um, you know, inspiring discussion. Uh, please, um, uh, our listeners, um, you may have questions to specific um, people you may ask now. I think we can, you know, uh, exceed a little bit more like 15 20 minutes if there are any questions or comments um, about anything uh, pardon ben bir de Türkçe söyleyeyim bunu <gülüyor> ee, e, Türkçe çeviri yapmaya şu anda zamanımız kalmadı ben bir sürü not aldım halbuki Türkçe olarak ama e, ileride YouTube'da e, kısa bir süre sonra altyazılı olarak yayınlayacağımız için e, bu sohbeti şu anda zamanı ona vermeyelim diye düşündüm. Ee, kızmayın ne olur. Ee, ama şimdi sizin sorularınızı e, alalım. Çete de yazabilirsiniz. Ee, bilmiyorum YouTube'dan da seyreden e, izleyicilerimiz olabilir. Belki onlardan da soru gelebilir. Biz e, hazırız eğer bir sorunuz varsa. Tamam. YouTube'dan şu anda bir sorumuz yokmuş. Hiç kimse bir şey sormak istemiyor mu? Ya da o kadar e, farklı hani boyutlar üzerinden tartıştık ki belki birazcık e, zaman geçmesini gerekir acaba. So, I think there are no questions. Ah, there is one. Okay. From Dila Yumurtacı. Um, okay, she asks, um, how, uh, apart from the physical field, how do we uh, work in the virtual space uh, in terms of touch? Uh, and this kind of work, how can it, you know, uh, give perception uh, about our bodies uh, if we work on a virtual space uh, how does it affect our uh, perception of our bodies actually Vanyo you mentioned a little bit about this when you talk uh, you mean uh, on online kind of uh, an online class yeah uh, well <laughs> in my in this pandemic uh, period uh, yeah we worked a lot with self uh, contact and giving kinesthetic feedback to ourselves and we worked a lot with the space obviously and the objects and the furniture 
so I I was uh, treating the rooms as a site and I was always saying the work that we're doing is almost like a site specific work right now and then uh, you can whatever uh, I would do with a partner I try to um, adjust it to the surfaces that uh, against which you can kind of lean and give a space or a wall or like um, a bookcase, a sturdy bookcase or like a bed. And um, we did a lot of work with, with, with weight and, and contacting that in that way. Um, and the relationship between the floor and the, and the furniture so that you can kind of sense um, through resistance you can sense again your structure and your bones your, your the organization of your bone structure and uh, also through reach the idea of like reaching towards something the reaching the pushing and pulling we, we worked a lot with uh, pushing and pulling reaching towards object exploring objects um, as inspiration for movement qualities um, and uh, yeah if i can think of anything and like we created a lot of um more compositional work i would say rather than training work um it was more than usual so we would end up kind of creating like some um uh, physical actions or some scenes um that were in specific parts of their space uh, because they you know they could kind of like turn the camera and we worked with different corners in the room and the volume the orientation the scale of things um so uh, again physical vocabularies but and also you know the qualities of touch like brushing tapping um molding you can do that on your own body of course it's not as pleasurable <laughs> as having another partner doing it if you're okay with being touched of course uh, but you get a sense and that kind of gives you a way into different movement qualities by working with different touch qualities yeah anything you want to add a slam she made no Okay, I think Fulia uh, uh, just uh, raised her hand before. I didn't see. Fulia, hi. Fulia'nın sesini açmamız lazım Hasan Bey. Teşekkür ederim. Uh, çok teşekkürler. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the meeting. It was really uh, very thought provoking, and hopefully, it's just going to be the beginning. Um, I was just going to comment on something that's really, I think, uh, very important. Uh, Shin had man mentioned it in the beginning. Um, I mean, the touch is not something um, that you can just do a lot, like just, it's it's a mutual sense organ and it's covered, it's covering the whole body. So um, I think um, we can never say that like uh, we, we touch without being touched. So uh, I think this is very important to remember that the trainer and the students, they are mutually touching each other because there's no other way to do that. <laughs> so uh, in that case, I think that whole idea of neutral touch becomes extremely important. Like to be able to uh, neutral, uh, make your touch uh, into a neutral touch. Um, that's um, that's more like a zero, basically, uh, in terms of intention. Uh, I think that's that's really important, and it requires a lot of will training, and uh, which I can add uh, while we are trying to teach or welcome no from students. I think we have to also trainers uh, have to teach ourselves to say no to ourselves as well in the meantime. So uh, it's a very mutual uh, journey. And I think it's everybody should be, as you guys were saying, like uh, very um, sensitive and um, um, open to uh, this, such discussions. So thank you again. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, Fulia. Can I say something in that? Of course, because please. I... I have um, a love and hate relationship with the, the, the word neutral, um, uh, like the neutral body, uh, like it's a Lecoq uh, term as well. Um, I, and I understand it as a performer. And for me, it's, um, there's something about it that also some, 
it can brush over or like suppress what there may be in the neutral state. It's a, it's a tricky it's a tricky territory, but maybe I was just thinking as like for instance the um, uh, there is a dance technique called release release technique, and there is another technique also a part of the release technique is called Skinner releasing technique. And that ing, the releasing, means it's an active, it's, it's an active state where you're not looking for an ideal state of release, but you are actively releasing in the doing and in the being, in stillness, in movement, wherever. And for me, that neutral, maybe it's like this, um, maybe neutral, like trying to neutralize as like a continuous state rather than a, an end state, because there's a lot of things happening at the same time as human beings were very complex and thank you Philia for saying about this touching and being touched is always the case yeah it's like that phenomenology of like being all the time in this mutuality which which makes it complex super super complex and what I want to say about that is like this stripping like maybe the neutral for me it makes me think of like stripping away of the unnecessary trying to find this sense of emptying rather empty um, and in order to find a place from which you can go anywhere you no know? uh, I guess that's the neutral state in Lecoq uh, from what I've understood it's like it's this kind of potentiality you no know, of like from there it can go anywhere and also it's that space where the audience can make also any associations so uh, it's about training the performer to kind of enter that stance of emptying to then fill it up, no? Um, fill it up with intention then. But um, it's not that it's not there. It's just that you don't place your focus there, no? Like your attention there to that intention. And it's that space of being, which is tricky and it's a constant training. Yeah. But thank you. That's a really, really, really key thing for uh, performers and tra trainees, I think. Biraz daha bekleyelim mi? Acaba e, soru gelir mi aklınıza? Evet. O zaman e, yavaş yavaş e, kapatalım. Um, I think it's time to close up the discussion. Um, thank you very much again, Sinead, Özlem and Vanyo for this um, inspiring talk um, and I think as Fulia said this is the beginning of many discussions and you know how we build the the training uh, field um, uh, with all this uh, experience coming from um, from very different directions uh, and we hope we can make further contacts with all of you uh, and I think we can learn from each other a lot. Um, I think another question just came from WhatsApp. Uh, okay, I think Ali Algen is the, the... Okay, Ali is asking. Sorry, one more question and then we will finish. Uh, he says a lot of methods and training styles uh, usually come from different cultures. Uh, and the physicality that comes with those, and then get translated. Hmm. This is, I think, also very important, right? Even words such as brush or arouse mean different things to people from different cultures. Do you have anything to say about this as trainers who work across different cultures? Yes. Um, to me, the, yes, it makes a huge difference because when I was, I was fully trained in Turkey until I went to London for my master's. And in Turkey, the word specific in Turkish, the word specific doesn't exist. Uh, so doesn't the concept of specificity, <laughs> specificity. So to me, when they said be more specific, I was like, I'm specific enough, I guess, whatever that means. So, <laughs> um, 
so stimulating a specific area or and and also arousal to me it comes from i don't know like not right now but uh, arouses a totally a sexual term it could be because it comes from a different like from tv from other like po popular culture so uh, it, it to me it's really difficult to uh, translate that for example the method that i'm trying to teach the link later method is so specific in wording and all the images are like poetry uh, and it, it is supposed to arouse feelings and it's, it is supposed to like uh, stimulate different areas of the body, etc. So to me, it was really, and also politically uh, in Turkey, our bodies are more, I don't know, like different, not more or less or anything, but different. Uh, I might find, uh, find myself or my students like women uh, acting like men most of the time, using their voice, like forcing their voices a bit more than uh, from a person from an Anglo-Saxon world, uh, coming from an Anglo-Saxon world. So, uh, but at the same time, I might have students who are more willing to surrender, to surrender to power in a Turkish classroom context than in a British classroom context. So when I was uh, contacting actors and uh, students in Britain, it was a completely different situation. I mean, I was like, they're older than me. They know better than me. Like, they know their boundaries. They're like, you can't touch me. I'm now. It's the time, like break the say, uh, time, like break time. Uh, I have to have my water. Like, it's like completely different situation. And in Turkey, they they just want you to like shake them and like, touch me, do whatever do you want, and then I'm like, so it's. Uh, then in Turkey, I had to teach to say no, uh, but with like with, within the context of fragility, because uh, when because when you are used to say no or resist in terms like uh, pushing a wall, because in Turkey you have to push the police barrier in order to say no many times, uh, then your voice is more forced, and when you say no, it has to be a no, but then maybe it comes from a fragile point, but fragility is not very allowed in the culture because then it's weakness. Um, so to me, it was really diff different. I, and Italy is another like completely different situation, but it's Mediterranean. I mean, it, I, it, to me it was, and also politically they were out from Berlusconi and that their salary is completely, uh, they are kind of, uh, they know what oppression is, not as much as uh, the Turkish part. Uh, I could find the dialogue, like a strong dialogue with the, for example, um, South American uh, colleagues of mine from Linklater world, because they are forced. They know how they need to push walls in, in order to raise, raise, raise their, like, it's not like lights and shining, like Crystal Linklater says, but it's more like shouting and screaming. <laughs> So, uh, so in terms of like politics and stuff, I, I found very like uh, as a close culture, I found uh, South Americans to be really close to us. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting subject. Very, and in terms of theater world and the instruction, like the tutors world, also in Linklater world is this being discussed a lot. Uh, I think it's a hot topic. Like who, who, like what, what, how do, as Wanyo said, there isn't such thing as neutral body and there are political bodies. We are all political bodies. And w when we say something, it touches in different ways. When we touch someone, it touches the, in different ways in each country and uh, in each city, maybe. So it's a tricky, yeah, tricky question. I did, Tim. Uh, anything you want to add, Sinead or Fanya? Uh, okay. I would just say that um, I've taught, um, yes, I've taught students from Hong Kong and uh, American students and British students and Italian and, uh, and um, French and Spanish. 
Um, and it is a, a journey. And I think this is where, in part, what, what we talk about in terms of uh, kind of a, a guru, uh, kind of smashing the, the, this idea of guru is really important because um, in my classroom, you're, uh, I am allowed to fail just like the students. Uh, and I kind of celebrate. <laughs> I try to celebrate when I make mistakes because I feel like that's me leading by example. And I think with language, that is something that's really key that I, I have to be, um, to be able to make mistakes and to learn particularly with language. It's a very important one. And, and to have then an exchange and a dialogue with the students through things like feedback, with translators, if you have the luxury of the translator, like I, I do in, in Italy, you know, what's the, what sort of language should we be using here? You know, we can go into a lot of detail, but um, yeah, it's, it's a minefield. <laughs> And obviously being working with actors, you see, you see the impact of your words on their bodies immediately, you know, immediately if you've said something that's wrong, it's there, it's present in the room. Uh, so I try to name that. I, uh, I've said the wrong thing. Uh, take a break, have a bit of water. Let's think about this. We might, I might discuss it with them other times. I'll do what, you know, Vanya was saying about uh, kind of not deflecting, but just, uh, you know, trying something completely different, a different, a different type of language uh, to, to try and encourage the specific movement I'm, I'm wanting them to explore. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, just very, I, yeah, I don't have a, I mean, I have a lot to say, but I don't think that it's productive. I come from a different, I am, uh, non-English uh, in an English environment so it's a different experience I've had um, and I've been quite self-conscious about uh, my language um, um, and I still am sometimes when I'm in environments where it's mainly um, English speaking students obviously so I'm, I'm kind of making extra effort and I find that uh, especially English students, I would say they uh, they require like a, a, a great specificity um, rather than kind of the body language. So um, the first years I was teaching, uh, it was more multicultural, uh, the environment that I was teaching. And because of the uh, raise of fee, the rise in fees and so on, uh, there is less and less kind of international students, um, fewer and fewer international students. And so um, I've had to teach myself to kind of find strategies of like repeating things. Uh, you know, ask, I ask very often, is, is it clear? Like, does that make sense? I think I almost ask it too much. Um, but I find that students more and more in general want verbal specificity and verbal clarity for safety reasons as well. As students, uh, young adults, um, there is a rise in like a really s a spike in mental health um, um, issues among young adults. Um, and uh, I find that they need to know there's the sense of control that they need to know in advance before they uh, engage into something. So they need to know cognitively almost uh, before they engage something and, and then they can find a way of re releasing. And that's a generalization, obviously, but I find a big, big change in the um, uh, academic world, like the conservatoires of like wanting to know in advance rather than going with the flow. <laughs> Um, and kind of uh, being uh, comfortable with the unknown. So that's a, like a big territory uh, that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a new, it's another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, new generations, right? <laughs> we will learn. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we will learn. Yeah, they teach us. <laughs> Definitely. But it's, I think, so important what you all said. I mean, acknowledging our errors also, uh, I think it's a very, very... Uh, delicate uh, issue uh, because we all learn um, from our experiences and as, as Lam said you know in the beginning I mean 10 years ago we were different people uh, and we were unexperienced uh, in terms of you know teaching 
because in Turkey we don't have pedagogical backgrounds. Um, so it's a very, very important um, process. Uh, we all have to grow up uh, in this uh, in this field. Well, thank you so much, Sinead, Vanyo and Özlem. Uh, hopefully we will continue further uh, discussions in uh, at different topics, uh, perhaps, but we we were delighted to host you tonight. Uh, thank you for your contributions and your opinions and your experience and your somatic um, um, magic, let's say. Thank you all and thank you for the or also for uh, our listeners uh, and we will, uh, um, you know, um, put this uh, on YouTube and with subtitles. Thank you Sundus for also your participation and stay healthy, stay safe. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting us and our pleasure. Yeah, I hope everything kind of somehow finds a, a more peaceful and uh, empowering kind of route for, especially for, for women um, uh, right now in Turkey. I hear what's happening. So um, it's also in Greece. It's very big. <laughs> um, yes. So yes. it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, a special time. Mm. So thank you again. And have a lovely evening. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Herkese hoşça kalın. Thank God. <laughs> Do we leave now? <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do. It's not Shall recording we? anymore, right? It, it's At not least. recording, but yeah. it's still live on YouTube. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Great, so we'll leave. Uh, it, it, it, <laughs> yeah, one by one. So leave. It was really great to see you both. Thank yeah. you so much, Aslan. Yeah. It was really lovely. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Banyo, uh, maybe I'll try, I'll get uh, your details and we'll meet in London. Please do, please, please, please. Yeah, through Uslan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I would love to meet you as well.